Okay, everyone, uh, we're going to get started in just a minute. Okay, everyone, we are going to get started with our last presentation, our last speaker of the day. Uh, Dr. Jason Hallstrom is a professor and director for the Institute in Sensing and Embedded Network Systems at Florida Atlantic University. So we're very excited to have somebody to bring a another local perspective to the conversation. Uh, Jason is the, was the founding executive director of the Institute in Sensing and Embedded Network Systems Engineering and is currently on assignment to the National Security Okay, he is the, um, I want to get this right. I kind of like where it was before. National Science Foundation and Program Director in the Directorate for Computer and Information Science and Engineering. Jason, is that a national appointment? Yes, it is. Okay, so let me turn it over to Dr. Jason Hallstrom. Thanks very much. Uh, it's really a, a pleasure to have the opportunity to, to be here today and, and to share some of the work that we've been doing in the context of smart cities. So my name is Jason Hallstrom, as, as Carl said. I have the, I've had the pleasure of working at Florida Atlantic now for about eight years, where uh, we founded a research institute that's focused on large-scale sensing. So this is a symposium that's focused on artificial intelligence. And so the natural question is, why the heck is this guy up here talking about sensing? And it's because sensing, in situ sensing in particular, sensing in place is sort of the, um, depending on your perspective, either, the, either the, the little brother or the big sister of artificial intelligence. When we talk about AI, we talk about machine learning, these are data-driven solutions that require large amounts of data to actually make good decisions. And it's the sensing systems that help to provide that data. So I'm going to talk about experience reports today. I'm, I'm hoping that folks will feel free to interrupt me. You should be, feel free to yell. You can throw things if you want. Whatever you want to do. Um, I hope it's more of a conversation than it is just me sort of blabbing up here for, for a bit. So please feel free to interrupt. I forgot the clicker already. So I'm going to talk about projects that are run through the Institute. Uh, Carl can attest that the name of this Institute does not roll off the tongue. So this is the the Institute for Sensing and Embedded Network Systems Engineering. We just call it iSense it at FAU. So I'm going to talk about iSense. iSense is a research institute. We're structured a little bit like a college, but we don't have a pure academic mission. So we don't grant degrees. We're focused on research projects. We bring in students to help us engage in projects that are federally supported. We work on industry supported projects, municipally supported projects, and kind of everything in between. We are an engineering institute, so we're fundamentally focused on sensing, computing, communication, security, and artificial intelligence. That's what we do. But we do that in the context of applied engineering research. So everything that we do is about serving a customer, whether that customer is the federal government, or that customer is a local municipality, or it's a local neighborhood, or, or it's just individual residents. So you're going to hear me talk about applications, about applications of engineering. So I'm going to focus on sensing applications, and I, I just want to kind of give a, a, a disclosure of sorts up front to say that we've been very fortunate to have our work supported over the last two decades uh, by, a, by a number of, of federal organizations and state organizations, and we're really very grateful to, 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 to these organizations for their support. I've also borrowed liberally from the web. So 
When you see these images, many of the images are not mine. I, I stole them, and I, I'm happy to provide references if anyone would like them. So the first project I'm going to talk about is focused on large-scale water management. This is a project that we began in 2007. We ran it for about eight or nine years, and it's focused on addressing the following concern. When we look at water consumption in the United States, if we look only at fresh water consumption, we use about 408 billion gallons of fresh water in the United States every day. So to put that into perspective, that's enough water to fill 8 billion bathtubs. It's enough water to fill the Empire State Building 1,470 times every day. It's 1,430 gallons of water per person in this room across the whole US. So that's a crazy amount of water. We've got 400 and somewhere around 435 million people in the United States today. We're going to be at 440 million by 2025. And so you see this kind of natural tension, a tension between our supply of fresh water and the demand for fresh water. And we, you know, we tend to view water through an emotional lens. We think of water as something that's just going to be there. But water is a scarce resource, and like any scarce resource, we make the best decisions about how to price it, how to allocate it, when we have high quality information about the resource. That's what this project is focused on. So you need an instrument that provides good visibility into water quantity and water quality at basin scales, at the scale of an entire water basin and the watersheds that drain into that basin. We call that instrument an environmental macroscope. So this sort of silly language is intended to evoke in your mind the picture of an instrument like a microscope, but with a broad lens, intended to take in key hydrological environmental parameters at landscape scales and to allow you to make decisions from a desktop with visibility across the whole of that basin and the, and the surrounding watersheds. Now the instrument itself is composed of intelligent water buoys. Now you have to sort of keep in mind that this is a project we did, began in 2007. So some of this is a little bit dated, but it gives you a sense of what we've been up to over the years. This is, uh, the instrument itself looks from the surface of the water like a series of marker buoys. So when you're cruising along in a boat and you see a marker buoy, it just looks like a regular old marker buoy, nothing particularly interesting. But submerged beneath the surface is a technology stack that does real-time water quality, water quantity sensing, collects the data, stores the data, and then transmits it to the cloud. By gosh, when we started this in seven, we didn't know it was called the cloud, but it turns out that's what we were doing. So we were pushing data to the cloud and storing it, and running analytics, and building dashboards, and so on, and so on, and so on. And the intent was to provide really high quality information to federal water management agencies, the Army Corps of Engineers in particular, to help them understand when best to time water withdrawals and water releases based on upstream watershed rain events and then the, 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 the corridors through which those basins drain. So if we look, for example, at, a, a, at an agricultural watershed and we have, for example, a concentrated animal feeding operation within that watershed and we know there's a rain event, we know that that rain event will have an impact on water quality with a well within a well-specified time period, and that informs us when to pull water out so that we are not drinking from the concentrated animal feeding operation. So that was the idea. There's a, uh, if I have time in the end, um, I would love to come back to this just to talk about what, it, what an exciting sort of interdisciplinary project this was because it was computer scientists and computer engineers, river ecologists, environmental toxicologists, mechanical folks who helped us to understand how do you build a buoy that can handle a 20-fold increase in water flow without being dragged downstream. This instrument was deployed, like I said, seven or eight years from the headwaters of the Savannah River Basin, North Carolina, South Carolina, Georgia corridor, all the way down to the port in Savannah. We covered 212 river miles and two dense, two dense uh, watersheds that drained down into the of course, when you collect this kind of data, you have to have good decision-making tools. You have to have good visualizations that can help your partners understand what the heck this data means and how they should act upon it. And so we spent quite a lot of effort back then and, and continued to do so, building tools that help our friends at the water management agencies understand water quality in real time and to understand how that water quality and quantity shifts throughout the day, throughout the week, throughout the month, and so on. 
The other thing that we had to do is as you start to scale something, a, a small IoT project, a small smart, smart cities project, from one sensor to two sensors, to now you're covering 212 river miles, you have to have really good tools to operate that network, to diagnose errors as they're occurring, and to dispatch your crew efficiently so that you're not just sort of having folks run around maintaining things that don't need maintenance. So this, this tool set allowed us deep diagnostic visibility into the hardware, into the software, into the whole stack so that we could see problems before they arose and dis dispatch folks appropriately. Now that project morphed a bit. We had the opportunity to work with the city of Aiken, South Carolina. This would have been back in maybe 2009. That project ran for maybe six, seven years, something like this. My, my, my memory is getting old, so I'm forgetting exactly. The city of Aiken is up in the northwest, I should say the town of Aiken is up in the northwest corner of South Carolina. It's a historic city. It's, it's a kind of an equestrian corridor. And they grew organically over time, like many cities do. So I remember meeting with the city manager and asking if we could see an example of some of the, the diagrams that they had, the architectural rendering, renderings that they had of their stormwater system. And they came back with hand-drawn maps from, gosh, who, who, knows, who knows when. So this gives you a sense of, of how the infrastructure grew as the municipality grew. So we had the stormwater system that kind of grew organically as folks moved to Aiken. And as a result, it didn't operate particularly efficiently. So there were two large drainage outflows for, the, for, the, for this uh, stormwater watershed that drained into the adjacent Hitchcock Woods, which is part of this big kind of equestrian complex. And in the course of just one generation, this little stream that would result from stormwater turned into a canyon. And so, whoops. And so you can see a picture of that canyon there in the bottom left-hand side of the slide, and that's carved entirely out of stormwater. So I remember that even during a, a small light rain event in the city of Aiken, you'd see a huge outflow of water created real problems, tore, tore this landscape up. And that story continues. Not only did this degrade an important entertainment area and an important source of revenue for the city, but it also washed all that sediment downstream into the wetlands just above the Savannah River Basin. And it, of course, decimated the ability of the wetlands to clean up the debris, to clean up the, the toxins, to clean up the junk that's caught in that watershed. So, of course, that's the question of what the heck did you guys have to do with this? The city was really super forward thinking and they wanted to become leaders in green infrastructure practice. So they were interested in bioswale, curb cuts, forest pavement, cisterns, and so on and so on. And these things are expensive. When you want to go in and you want to tear out whole chunks of pavement, you want to tear up all of the hard space and replace it with green space, that's a very expensive proposition. The city wanted to have some way to convey back to residents and other stakeholders, what's the bang for the buck? What's the value of doing this? If we invest three and a half million dollars, which is what the city ended up investing in six pilots for green infrastructure practices, what's the impact on water quality at the outflow? And what's the impact on water quality? This is a super, super interesting problem for an engineering institute. So we built a water balance for the city. And so this water balance captures information about rainfall. So we have weather, sta had weather stations all over the place in Aiken, capturing information on inputs. We had acoustic Doppler current profilers. So these are instruments that measure water flow within the stormwater system. So I think if I remember correctly, we had 14 or 15 of those installed throughout the stormwater system itself. And then we had, um, these are called volumetric water content rates. These are sensors that measure water within the soil, total suspended water within the soil. And we measure that at six inches, 12 inches, 18 inches, and 24 inches, gridded throughout the green space. So that gave us the ability in real time to understand how much water was coming down, how much water was being trapped within the soil, how much water was trapped within the stormwater system, how much water are we making it out to the outflow? So as the city invested in the infrastructure project, we quantify for the city, here is the impact that that particular PMP had at that time. This is a great project for us. It's a great project for the city. The city went on to win a number of state awards, uh, including a, a federal award from the EPA for, for their work on it. I always joke, we work with a lot of students, of course, and, and of course you see folks crawling down in the sewer holes here, and I always say, you know, we have openings for undergrads. Uh, it, it doesn't often work. 
Now that same technology stack has continued to, to expand. We've deployed that technology stack in the Kissimmee River to understand the ongoing restoration effort. And we've expanded what we're collecting through these environmental monitoring networks in Florida, large, actually I should say all along the Atlantic coast, largely with a focus on atmosphere. So we do a lot of monitoring of, of atmosphere. We have a large weather sensing network, it's approximately 165 weather stations today that are deployed from Miami all the way up into North Carolina, primarily all along the Atlantic coast, with some on the west coast as well. All of the information that we collect through this weather monitoring network is funneled not only to our stakeholders, to our, our, our uh, municipal partners' websites and so on, but also to the National Weather Service. And it's used as part of their forecasting models, it's used as part of their climate studies. And so we, we love to tell people that whenever you receive a weather report on the news or anywhere in South Florida, along the, actually all along the Atlantic coast, those weather reports are driven by data collected by instruments designed and manufactured by students of Florida Atlantic. So I think that's pretty cool. Um, to give you a sense of what our weather network looked like, that picture there is a little bit old. One on the bottom left, that now is three years out of date. So the network has been expanded quite a bit. We have exactly the sort of data portal that you can expect, including the National Weather Service portal, but you can go to Sense stream.org and pull down weather from the last couple yeah, something like that. Uh, we have all the sort of data plots you can imagine, and, and of course, if you are interested in hosting a weather station, it basically means you've got a spot where weather data would be useful to you, and you'd be able to help us with any permitting or permissions. We have weather stations that are ready to go. It's a full service kind of thing. So we have an engineering team that's responsible for deploying these instruments and managing them. We're happy to do that at no cost to the municipality or to the public. Another project that is somewhat of an outgrowth of this is focused on water level monitoring. So in addition to the kinds of sensing that I've, I've already described, we're in the process of building out a nationwide water level monitoring network through support from NOAA and their pro a, a program called Sephora. So this project is focused not only on monitoring water levels on the coast, particularly focused on monitoring inland water bodies so that we can do a better job of forecasting inland flooding, particularly in advance of storms. So if you have an interest in hosting a water level sensor, if you have an interest, I'm good, I'm glad not to have if, um, if you have an interest in hosting a water level sensor, please reach out. If we, again, same kind of model. Oh, you're good. I'm ready to go. Okay, there we go. This gives you a sense of what those installations look like. Just examples, one at Fernandina Beach, we have one at, uh, at uh, Navsi Carderock. Uh, both of those combine the weather sensing network as well as the water level network. I'm gonna talk about one more marine and environment topic before I kind of shift gears and I'll talk about some of our other application areas. So, so this particular project is again focused on flooding and it's focused on tropical storm flooding resulting from tropical storms. So if we look at the last four decades and we look at deaths resulting from hurricanes over the last four decades, more than 50% of those deaths come from inland flooding. Now that, I find that very surprising. It doesn't match my intuition at all. When, I, when we think about hurricanes, we tend to think about storm, storm damage, we tend to think of wind damage and so on. It turns out that in the majority of cases, that is not what results in deaths. It's inland flooding. Inland flooding in this case is defined as flooding that occurs more than 25 miles away from the coast, and that's responsible for the majority of the deaths. That happens because as the hurricane makes its way, and, and of course we all know how these hurricanes tend to go lately, they crawl all along the Atlantic coast, they dump a huge amount of water all throughout South Florida, actually all the way along the coast. The eye tends to miss us and it goes up and it smacks into North Carolina. And then that outer band of the storm whips back around and it dumps more water. And so the problem there is that the, the, the earth behaves like a sponge. So that eye crawls, crawls through, dumps a bunch of water, the sponge saturates. And then when that outer band comes back around and dumps more water, it's like pouring water onto a wet sponge and you have super lateral flooding. That's when the water is moving so sideways very quickly because the earth has no capacity to absorb. Okay, so, so this is the problem we were interested in focusing on. 
Now, what is the federal government? I'm not picking on the federal government. It's not just the federal government. What is our collective capacity to forecast inland flooding? Turns out it stinks. So take Hurricane Irma as, as an example. So Hurricane Irma is still, um, for us anyway, we had some damage, we had, it's still a, a, a close memory. And what was the guidance we received from the federal government? What kind of flooding would we see? Be concerned, because you could see flooding between 5 and 25 foot. Like, what? 5 and 25 foot? 5 foot of flooding is inconvenient. 25 foot of flooding is a different sort of animal. And so we need to do a better job being able to provide forecasts to residents, because if we continue to tell residents, look out, 25 foot of flooding, 25 foot of flooding, people will ignore it. We'll habituate to the warnings, because we know that the warnings tend not to be correct. And then, when they are correct, we've got a serious problem because people haven't evacuated. So this is what we were trying to solve. Now, I'm not clever enough to explain to you why this is the case, but I can tell you the root cause for these forecasting challenges. And it has to do naturally with, with modeling, with monitoring of, of wa modeling of water flows. The key to being able to forecast inland flooding with high accuracy is to understand what's happening on the water surface, to understand water surface dynamics in real time in advance of the storm. I can't fully understand why that is the case, but this is the case. So this is, this, this is the missing component, right? So we wanted to build sensor technology that would allow partners to be able to collect information on surface water dynamics prior to the storm. So this is what we ended up building. This was, a, again, a, a project I was really, uh, our whole team was really excited about. We call these things micro buoys. So these micro buoys, they're not so dissimilar from some of, the, some of the electronics that are included in your cell phone. So they include an inertial measurement unit, they include GPS, they include some telemetry capability, wireless communication capability, storage, and so on. And they're tossed within inland streams, inland lakes, and so on, or they're released from beneath the surface in advance of the storm. This is our, our, our former chief engineer tossing one of these in. It was raining on us that day. These things float, pass along, collect real-time information, and then transmit it to our modeling partners up in North Carolina who use that information to forecast flooding events. This gives you a sense of just kind of what that data looks like. I won't drill down into it except to say that it captures the kind of information that an inertial measurement unit captures. That's the same sort of device that's in your cell phone for, for understanding rotation and so on. It's the same kind of thing that's used within drones to provide flight stability. Okay, so it's, an, it's called an IMU. So I'm going to switch focus a little bit, and now I'm going to talk, start talking more about infrastructure systems, things that are sort of more closely related to, to, to urban centers. So the first one I'll talk about is, again, focused on water, and then I'll really change topics so you don't think we only focus on water. And this project was focused on irrigation systems. Now, we talked about how much water is used in the U.S. each year, or, I'm sorry, each day, so it's 408 billion gallons of fresh water. About one-third of that is used for irrigation systems, both agricultural and residential. So residential systems, if I remember correctly, account for about 9 billion gallons of that water usage each day. Now, it turns out that the average American household leaks 10,000 gallons of water a year. On average, some houses more, some houses less. And the majority of that, at least in Florida, comes from irrigation systems. Now, I'm, I'm sort of a, a well, I think, man, I think, I used to say that I think everyone is a transplant in Florida. I know that's not true. Um, but I'm a transplant, and I remember when we first moved here, I'm an early riser, and I would, I would go out in the morning before the sun was up and be walking around the neighborhood. And of course, you, I think everybody sees this. You, your neighbors are busy watering the concrete, and they're, they're, they're <laughs> watering the street. Street doesn't grow. Uh, and then the problem is by the time the sun comes up and, and your late rising neighbors come outside, everything's dry. So you don't know that there's a problem, right? So you've got these leaks. So we were interested in addressing this problem of leak detection and, and notifying homeowners of leaks. That's an easy problem if you focus on above ground leaks. So if you focus on above ground leaks, it's like, well, put up a camera, put up ground sensors, whatever. You'll, you'll find the leaks and you can notify the homeowner. We were interested in underground leaks. So we were interested in the leaks that result in sinkholes, structural problems, and so on, which are really hard to diagnose until you have a dip in your yard or, or, um, or, or worse, right? Now the challenge with that 
is to be able to detect underground leaks, you've got to put the sensors underground. And then the value proposition for the homeowner is dicey because you're like, oh, I've got this amazing system. It's going to help you to identify leaks underground. Homeowner says, fantastic, what do I got to do? No problem. Every year you've got to dig it up and replace the 9-volt battery. It'll be easy, no problem. Of course, no one's going to do that. So it's not going to work. So we wanted to develop a system that would offer perpetual sensing, perpetual computing with zero maintenance. Now, I'm going to talk about the students just a little bit, because um, I, I, I just like the story so much. We, we wanted to bring together a team of undergraduates to pursue this project. And so the challenge was, we're going to find funding to support a project for you to build a sensor that will harvest energy from the flow of water through the irrigation system and use that, use that harvested energy to do sensing, computing, communication, and reporting back to the home. We knew that when we put that together, that's a, that's a big ask for, for most undergraduates. So we had an idea that I'm, I'm, um, I'm, I'm, I'm really proud of, which was that we ought to be looking at our undergraduates who had prior military experience. So the thought was, well, if we can find folks who have led complex projects before, who have leadership training, then we can partner them with other undergraduates, and they might be able to do something that we didn't think was particularly possible, and that's precisely what happened. So the system that you see that's built up there, I, I'm the guy who gets to talk about these cool things, but it's actually students who do all the work. And this was built by four undergraduates. And so they built a sensor that is installed within the irrigation head. It uses a small micro turbine to harvest energy from the, from the inline flow of water. It then disconnects itself from the irrigation system, performs a measurement, performs computation, and transmits that information into the home. When you have those installed at multiple locations throughout the home, then the unit in the house can learn the natural flow regime of the irrigation system. Then when there's a violation of that natural flow regime, it can use that violation to pinpoint where the leak is underground and to alert the homeowner. Um, this, this project, well, actually, if I start talking about it, I'll talk too long. I'll just say I was so excited by this project, we, we wanted to find more money to support this. We funded this out of a small project from the government, uh, funded at the level of about $26,000. So this was obviously pre-COVID and stuff like that. Um, I took the, the unit that you see in the top right-hand corner. And so that unit in the top right-hand corner was a, a pilot, which allowed us to pump water from a bucket to demonstrate how this system would work. I put it in a suitcase. I went to the National Science Foundation. And this is when you could actually visit the National Science Foundation. And I, I just knocked on program director's doors. Have to see the cool thing that the students at FAU had built. And eventually, we found a PD who would, who would listen and invited us in. And we filled our bucket up with water. We demonstrated it. And we left with a commitment to fund those graduate students for their master's degree. So all those students went on, our vets went on to, to receive master's degrees in computer science and engineering. So that, I, I think, a, a really cool outcome. They were also all named inventors on the patent. So they have dollar signs clicking in their eyes. They're reasonably sure they're going to be wealthy. We're not, we're, we're not wealthy yet. So we're, we're working on it. So now I want to talk about another smart cities project, but smart cities from a very different kind of perspective. When we think about smart cities, when we, when we talk about smart cities, we think about control. We think about automation. This is what smart cities are about when you look at the press, right? It's about can we have really good information and then can we automate cars? Can we automate garbage collection? Can we have robots that deliver pizzas? Can we uh, can, can we control water consumption and so on and so on and so on? It's all about controlling things, right? It's called the Internet of Things. Smart cities is about controlling things. I think it's a huge mistake to focus exclusively on controlling things. So what, why did we invest in the smart cities vision? It's not because we want a bunch of scooters dumped on the doorsteps of City Hall. We, we don't want sensors everywhere monitoring us and doing facial recognition. This is not what most of us want, right? We invested in the vision of smart cities because we believe in the efficiency improvements that it can provide, or we hope for. We hope for the efficiency improvements that it, that it promises, right? Now, when we think about what are we trying to achieve, well, we're trying to achieve a improved energy efficiency. We're trying to improve our resource consumption, less water waste. We're trying to improve our food waste, right? This is what it's about. You can't solve those problems only through control because they're tied to human behavior. The greatest improvements that we can see in cities comes not from controlling cars and controlling bridges and phones and everything else. It comes from influencing human behavior for the better, for the good of all. 
So this is, this is another way to look at smart cities, and I want to talk about one model of achieving that. Now, I'll give you a forewarning. I, I've talked about this project a, a, a number of times before, um, and, and quite often there are folks in the room who are like, this, this is nonsense. This is just pie in the sky, nonsense. Nobody is going to improve their behavior just because it's good for their neighbor. I'm going to disagree, and I'll try to provide some evidence of that in a minute. So I'm going to talk, in this case, about food waste reduction. So if we look at how much food is wasted in the US, it's a staggering amount of food. So 30 to 40% of the food that we produce in the United States every year is wasted. Okay, so nobody eats it, goes to waste. The majority of that food is post-consumer food waste. So this is food that we buy, but we don't eat. So in our house, we perpetually have an oversupply of spinach and avocados. Right? We're like, oh, it's two for one spinach, fantastic. And then you know, we throw one spinach out three or four days later, and avocados and the rest. Right. So the, the thinking was, um, where would be the best places to address this, this problem? And we thought, well, let's try to address this in all-you-can-eat eateries, in buffet-style eateries. Okay? So we thought, let's try it first on a university campus. So we thought, can we impact how much food people take so that they take the amount that they can eat? Is that possible? And it turns out that the incentives are quite well aligned for that sort of solution because at universities across the country, the dining facilities are privatized. And the managers of those dining facilities are personally incentivized to reduce food waste. And so this was awesome for us because we're always looking for partners who will help us install technology. And by gosh, if you have someone whose who's, who's pocket is, is influenced by the technology you're deploying, that's a fantastic scenario. So I'm going to talk about a system that we built a number of years ago, this was pre-pandemic, right? It's, it, I, I don't even know if there are all-you-can-eat eateries anymore, uh, but there used to be quite a few. And we built systems that would monitor in real time waste. So we built these sensors that would measure the waste in various receptacles. So we would measure food waste and we would measure recyclables. And the thinking was, is there a way that we could present that information back to consumers at the point of sale in ways that, not, not, not like reprimanding, but in ways that would encourage better behavior through implicit feedback, sort of ambient feedback. So the way that we did that, we went to the largest dining facility on campus, serves all of our students, and we put a very large screen uh, display up at the point of sale, and we tried a bunch of different visualizations that were designed to improve human behavior for the good, to cause people to take less, to take what they needed. Now, truth be told, I'm gonna sort of I'll give you the punchline, which is that this darn thing worked. I don't know if it's that people took less or they ate more, so I didn't weigh them on the way out, so I don't know. But either way, there was a, a substantial reduction in food waste, and I'll quantify that in just a second. Now, it turns out, um, I want to talk about two things, sort of coming back to this idea that, that perhaps this is crazy. Okay, so the idea here is that we want to influence people to make decisions that are good for the whole. It turns out that human psychology just doesn't work that way. So you can't tell most people, just on average, psychology tells us that if we tell someone, you ought to do this because it's good for your neighbor, nobody cares. I don't care what's good for the neighbor. Right? This is average, average. I'm not picking on anyone in particular, just average. right? But what works is when you say, your neighbor's doing this, perhaps you should too. So that's called the, the theory of social norming. And it basically gets at the root of us wanting to be normal, like the rest of our neighbors who we respect. Okay, so this is why the electric company sends you a bill that tells you how much your neighbor uses. Okay, so if they just tell you to use less or use more, that doesn't work. But if they compare you to a neighbor, you're like, oh, I better, I better, get, my, I better get my act in order and do what they're doing, right? So this was the idea. We thought, can we gamify this and report to the students how their food waste, in aggregate, not individually, how their, how their food waste compares to the food waste at the University of Florida, that compares to UCF, that compares to other places, and get them to behave better. Would this work? Now it turns out that the way you present the information matters a lot. If you just collect information and you're like, oh, this dining facility produced whatever, whatever it is, a thousand pounds of weight this week, what is, I don't know what that means. It doesn't tell me anything. So you think, well, you could give me a graph and compare my trend line to the University of Florida or UCF or whoever, 
And that's slightly better. At least I can, I can compare them. But it turns out those don't work that great either. So you need something that resonates with the audience. So we tried three different types of what we called ambient displays. That's not our, our language. That comes from elsewhere. They're a little hard to see, but the one on the left hand, top left-hand side is a beach scene. And that beach scene begins all beautiful at the start of the day. And so it's, it's animated, and it, it's got the ocean, and you've got people enjoying the beach, and there's umbrellas, and life is great. But as food waste increases relative to the norm of that dining facility, you begin to see garbage pile up on the beach. And then the, well, first it starts in a can, and then it overflows and fills the beach, and it occludes the image. And then there's a little chart on, on what that means. So that was display one. Display two, again, to give you the, the punchline, display two did not work. So display two was, well, let's try to present that weight information in terms of something that students might resonate with. And we thought, well, pizza. Students love pizza. Let's tell them the equivalent weight in Papa John's supreme pizzas that were wasted that day. So same idea. As the food waste increased over time, we would stack the pizza boxes up. It would be slices, 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 boxes, 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 so on. The last one tells a story. And I, I like the last one quite a bit. So the last one is a bunch of animated characters. So it's a bunch of students sitting around the table. And their, their story evolves over the, over the week. And so the students start out, and they're talking, and they're like, oh, how's your day going? Oh, amazing. The professor loves me. Like, my grades are good. Everything's awesome. And then as food waste increases, if it increases, again, above norm, whatever that might mean, the story changes. It's like, how are things going? Not so good. Failed my biology exam. You know? How's your professor? Terrible. Worst guy I've ever had. Bald. Hate him. Right? So that was, that, that, that was sort of how this went. So now the question is, does this, does this work? This does not. So, so, same slide. The answer is, yeah, it works. We ran this pilot for, shoot, I can't remember exactly how long, but it was long. I want to say six months, something like that. And we had an 18% reduction in food waste for display one and display two. Okay, so that is the, the, the cute sort of story version. And then the first one, which is all about including the beach scene. The one with pizzas made things worse. Any idea why? Because people like pizza. It triggers your hunger response. So, of course, what one of our friends in the College of Medicine explained this to us. We were like, oh, yeah, well, that makes a lot of sense. Yeah, of course. Probably you don't want to show people like a bunch of cookies right before they go to the buffet line, right? So, so yeah, so this thing worked. Now, this is a really interesting number, 18%. There's food insecurity in every state in the country. And it turns out that the deficit is 14% on average. So that means that ignoring logistics, right? Because you have to transport it. It's not an easy problem. But if you had a 14%, if you had 14% more availability in distribution, you could solve food insecurity. So 18% is an important number. Okay, again, lots of details are missing, right? Like how do you transport the food and get it to the places where, where there is food insecurity and food islands and so on. But again, I think this is a really interesting step in the right direction. I love this picture. The student who was responsible for this, her name is Cherie Hughes. She ended up going to work at Motorola uh, and a, a couple other places. And um, every day outside of my office, I would see Cherie's head inside of a garbage can. And <laughs> I like this picture because she was doing a PhD in computer science. I was like, wow, I bet you never thought you'd spend your, your, your four or five years with me with your head inside of a can. She said, no, I, I did not, or I, I would have done something else. So the last project I'm going to talk about is the West Palm Beach Mobility Intelligence Project. And the West Palm Beach project is, is focused really on answering, it's a technology project just like the others, but it's focused on answering three very human questions. In downtown West Palm Beach, where do people want to go? How do they get there? What are the challenges that they encounter along their paths? Those are the three questions. Okay? So how do we answer them? We answer this through mobility monitoring. Okay? Some people call this mobility tracking, but tracking suggests cameras. So the key here is that we wanted to be able to monitor, to track individual pedestrian mobility patterns, the way that people move throughout the street, and to do that in a way that was wholly anonymized. So the rendering that you see up here with the dots over the faces, that's intentional. So the idea is we want to understand how individuals move without knowing the individual, without being able to track that information back to an individual's home 
or to wherever it is that they happen to go. Okay? So the idea here, uh, so I'm not a Harry Potter fan, but perhaps by a show of hands, do we have any Harry Potter fans in the room? Okay, good. We have, we have at least one. So there's this thing in Harry Potter called the Marauder's Map. And the Marauder's Map allows you to look down and understand where everybody is. So that's kind of the idea. We want to be able to look down at something like Google Earth, and we want to be able to understand in a way that's wholly anonymized where everybody is and where they're going, okay? how they're moving through the street, the problems that they have. Now, the way that we did this, because this can, this, this can sound terrifying, so, so, so let, me, let me explain a little bit how this works. How many of you, show of hands, have a Wi-Fi device on you? Cell phone, Fitbit, smartwatch. I think everybody. OK, great. So that device is constantly sending out a little probe that's basically saying, is there anybody out there, if you're a Pink Floyd fan? Okay, so is there anybody out there? This thing is called a Mac probe request. And even when you're not using your wireless device, it's sending out that that probe to ask, is there a wireless network that it can connect to? Now, you can listen for those probes, ambiently, passively, without interacting with the device, without permission. So you can listen to that, and then you can measure the strength of that signal. So if I can listen for a back probe request, or you imagine doing it in here and people are yelling out, you know, like, hey, Jason, at different volumes, I can estimate how far away you are from me just by listening. And that's the idea behind the Mobility Intelligence Project, is let's, let's, let's listen for packets, 